So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. The retail business in America is sick. The economy has taken a toll on our traditional buying habits, and the industry is looking for a cure. Meet the doctor, Dr. Herb Sorensen. He's the CEO and president of TNS Sorensen, a consulting firm that specializes in observing and measuring shoppers' behavior within the walls of a store. He is the author of an incredibly detailed new book, Inside the Mind of the Shopper, The Science of Retailing, which breaks down what shoppers are thinking in large part based on their eye movements while shopping. If you're a professional within the retail industry, I think you'll find Sorensen's observations of great use. And if you're a shopper, you may gain some great insight about the way successful retailers market their wares to you. Dr. Sorensen, Herb, welcome yes. to Mr. Media. Thank you very much. Yes. Glad to have you here. <laughs> yes, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I, I might make a comment uh, by way of introduction here. Uh, sure. One of the things is that uh, you know I often present to brand manufacturers and their retailer partners, and I always tell them, well, I'm here to represent the voice of the shopper themselves. And uh, the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of times there is kind of a an adversarial relationship presumed between retailers and shoppers with a tug of war going on. When the reality is, I mean, shoppers go into stores because they want to buy things, and mm-hmm. uh, it's all about expediting that process. I would have guessed that the tug of war would be between the uh, the retailers and the suppliers more than the retailers and the customers. <laughs> Yes, I see you've been around the block a bit. <laughs> that's certainly true. That's certainly true. Uh, that's certainly true. But uh, as retailers turn their attention to actually selling, uh, as opposed to buying, and as uh, a, a good friend of mine pointed out, retailers don't make money selling; they make money buying. Uh, mm-hmm. And as you've alluded, it's their relationship with the brand suppliers that uh, generates the uh, lion's share of their profits. We could talk about it in some detail. But uh, wanting to look at the shopping side of the thing, and I will say there is a massive uh, global trend going on of retailers attempting to become astute at selling to the shoppers. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a, uh, I have a presentation uh, coming up at Shopper Insights Conference uh, uh, next month uh, on the return of personal selling uh, uh, to the retail space. And by that, I'm not talking about having clerks running around the store uh, offering to help you buy your toothpaste. But uh, th- that might uh, – maybe that would be of interest to your listeners. The, uh, well, what the Yeah, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, here's – because this is quite, uh, quite fascinating from a historical point of view. A hundred years ago, uh, retailing largely became self-service. Uh, obviously, they're fine clothers, jewelers. I mean, there's still a lot of personal selling goes on at retail. But the mass of retailing became self-service, and this was a consequence of the fact that production, a 100 years before that had become mass, okay, and distribution and all of those things happened. Uh, ultimately, retailers became self-service, and you had mass retailing be- begin in a major way. And at that point, uh, retailers basically moved out of the selling phase. I mean, I know you, they think of you know uh, that they're selling, but they're not really. They're stocking small warehouses, and the shopper does the selling selling themselves. That's what self service is. Well, mm. so who's going to do the selling? Well, up steps companies like Procter and Gamble with their soap operas, and the mass media became the replacement for personal selling, and you move to mass media. Okay, over the past 20 years, and the soap operas and all of the stuff that went with that, over the past 20 years, there's been fragmentation, serious fragmentation of that, uh, of that uh, media market, uh, and an increasing interest on, in selling in the store. Unfortunately, most of the personal selling skills that are required were lost, and if you want to, and, and are, are now in the process of being recovered. And if you want to see what I mean when I say personal selling, just check Amazon, who I think is one of the finest retailers in the world. 
uh, when you show up at Amazon, they immediately target you. They make offers to you. They tell you what other people are buying. I mean, they, they are assisting. So there is an assistance process, and uh, this will accelerate in the uh, in the bricks and mortar stores as there is more, uh, for example, two way digital media. Uh, whether it's uh, actually the huge thing that's going to come down very soon is going to be the PDA as the deployment of the Internet in the store. Uh, hmm. But uh, my point is simply this. One of the reasons that a lot of in-store media has crashed and burned, or another way to say is burned hundreds of millions of dollars of people's money to no effect, uh, is that uh, they were attempting to essentially use the, the limited amount of personal selling skills uh, developed in the television and, and other advertising and to move that into the store. And that's not the challenge. <laughs> the challenge is uh, basically is the uh, Amazon challenge. I mean, you need to think Amazon uh, if you're working in store, and you don't have to have technology in order to do that. So that's largely what my focus is today. I'm not all about technology. I'm all about uh, what does the shopper want to buy? Uh, you know, how much do they want to buy? And uh, where in the store do they want to buy it? And how can we pay attention to the shopper and respond e efficiently uh, to them? And uh, to me, one of the saddest things is the massive amount of sales that do not occur. And the shopper wanted to occur. They were there for the purpose, but they just gave up. Now, this is, uh, this is something that's very interesting in your book. Uh, you talk – using the eye track, you, you see where people look and where they don't look. And one of the things you talk about is a lot of times people come in and they just – they can't even find what they came into the store for. Exactly. Those are the two, uh, the two barriers to sales at any store. Uh, are, uh, the two barriers are where, where is – uh, whatever, you know, where is it? Where is it? And then when you get there, there's such a massive array to select from that you're then faced with the overwhelming problem. Which one of these? Which one of these is for me? It, or is any of them? Or, or what? And uh, the, both of those processes can be, uh, uh, can, uh, can be expedited. And the, the overwhelming factor uh, from the shopper's point of view, whether they articulate it or not, is time. And uh, uh, just to give you an example, let's say you're wheeling your shopping cart down the aisle. You wheel into the carbonated soft drinks aisle, and you want to buy something. Now, as a matter of fact, this is a pretty confusing aisle to shop. If it takes, oh, yeah. you, if it takes you a minute to find what you want, you're unlikely to spend another minute finding another one. Okay, uh, I mean, this, this is drawing on the old rule. You know, close early and close often. The faster you sell, the more you will sell. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, we, we know. I mean, this is the rule that Amazon uses. They got 50 million books, but they're trying to get you to the one you want or will buy right now because the mm -hmm. faster you do that. Here's the point: all the time you spend closing a sale is time you can't spend. You can't get from the shopper to work on another sale. So uh, one of the major th uh, themes of my book is simply this, stop wasting the shopper's time. <laughs> I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Now, we've got a, we've got a call for you, so let me, uh, let me bring sure. the caller on. We won't keep them waiting uh, much longer. I think, I think this is uh, – wait a minute. Let's see. Okay, I think this is Easy Rider who's been in our uh, the live web chat that accompanies uh, Mr. Media Interviews. Is that you, Easy? Yes, sir. How are you today, Mr. Media? Good. Thanks for calling in. You have a Great. question for Dr. Sorensen? Yeah, yeah. Hi, doctor. How are you today? Very well. And yourself? Good, good. Real good. A little, little uh, cloudy here in Pittsburgh today. But besides that, I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I suffer from a disability that uh, doesn't allow me to leave my home. So I rely on the Internet for my, all my shopping needs, okay? Yes. And really, you know, with the, with the Internet, the only thing I miss going to the malls is the touchy feely part of shopping because I really don't go and be able to touch my products and actually physically see them uh, before I buy them. But I've noticed with Amazon, and I'm not just plugging Amazon, but I've, I've shopped a lot of the companies, uh, Target, Biz, all of them. And, um, you know, Amazon really gives you the next best thing 
to being able to actually touch it and feel it. And what I like about Amazon and shopping on the Internet is if I really don't like the product, just for the fact that I don't like it, they will return it, and I get no problems at all. And I sure. attach a note to it that I explained it to them. I just didn't like this product, and I've never had a problem getting out with a return with, uh, with them. Well, I can see we're certainly in full agreement on, you know, on on uh, on Amazon. Uh, but addressing, uh, you know, the touchy feely issue. Yes. Uh, and of course, this is the one huge advantage that the uh, o- that the offline retailer uh, has and is likely to have, uh, you know, forever because there is an experience uh, in the retail space, and there is a lot of stumbling around in terms of you know, what that is and what do we have to provide and whatever. But the thing that you're referring to is the ability to pick up the product, turn it over, look at it, and so on. Yeah. And uh, I, I will say that uh, that there are, in fact, we have a sister company that uh, that is heavily involved in the virtual uh, reality space. And uh, the only thing keeping them from providing much more realistic uh, experience in home is bandwidth. And uh, you know, when if if you if you have ma- massive bandwidth, they can right. deliver a great deal more experience to you. That's that's the bottom line on that. So the good news is the long term prospects for an improved online experience with more sensory uh, feeling is there. But uh, the the the, uh, the reality is one of the reasons Amazon is so good is because they have they have monitored the click stream very very carefully and uh, respond to every movement that you make. I mean, they're on top of it right now. They're responding, 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 and they have a massive amount of learning uh, behind that. And uh, when you look at it, uh, what we do in the store is we track, uh, we track the carts and baskets and the shoppers on a second-by-second basis the same way Amazon does. So we have what we call the in-store uh, click, click, click of the shopper, uh, which parallels the online click, click, click at Amazon. <clears throat> and this is, quite, uh, uh, this is quite shocking to a lot of people, but uh, Peter Fader and Wendy Moe actually provided one chapter in my book, and they discuss this relationship between the online click stream and the offline click stream. And from a statistical and pattern point of view, there are amazing similarities. Hmm. That's because in your mind you have to go through the same steps. I mean, you, you're, you're looking, you're, you're checking, you're, you know, you're browsing, and now you're getting zeroed down on to what you're going to, where you're mm-hmm. likely going to make a selection, and finally the selection process occurs. I right. mean, and this is why deployment of the internet in the store is uh, is so important for this return to personal selling ultimately. And, right. and as a matter of fact, this is a this is a done deal. Uh, I mean, you know, right now. Uh, you can take your cell phone in the store, and you can use the camera to uh, snap a uh, snap a shot of the barcode on a product. And uh, and uh, you, this is some uh, technology that I believe Microsoft has uh, uh, pioneered. Anyway, and you ev- essentially have scanned the product, and you can pull down all kinds of information about the I product. I didn't know that, including comparative prices. Now look. Uh, th- this stuff uh, is, uh, you know, cutting edge. It's out there right now, uh, but there there are many companies that are that are working furiously to leverage this uh, in a large way. Now you're in in uh, Pittsburgh. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, although, do you have Giant in Pittsburgh? Uh, no, no. Okay, uh, Giant Eagle is probably over there. Anyway, Wait, Giant Eagle, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a different company. But anyway, uh, Stop and Shop, which is part of the Alhole family up in uh, Boston, has uh, you know close to a hundred stores uh, equipped with a uh, personal shopping assistant. They call it a Motive Shopper, but uh, it's basically uh, your your handheld device, whether it's a phone, a PDA, or whatever, uh, will ultimately be able to morph into this. Uh, retailers are looking at providing the devices. Uh, which obviously then they can have proprietary, you know, advanced features that they can't have. The most advanced one is MediaCart. Uh, and MediaCart, uh, of course, th- this is the full deployment. I mean, you essentially have a lop- laptop mounted. Uh, the screen is out on the front of your cart, so it's not jammed right up in your face. But uh, this gives you full Amazon capability uh, in the store. And uh, 
you know, I, I'm just telling you this is a very, very active area. And uh, two things, uh, the virtual reality will ultimately bring you more <laughs> of the in-store experience into your home. Uh, and at the same time, deployment of, uh, of the uh, Internet in one form or another will essentially merge the home experience with the online, uh, with, with the uh, uh, in-store experience. Yes, I, I feel I get a lot more information off of the Internet than I would going to a store. Um, yeah, absolutely. when you go to the store, you don't bring, like you said, you don't bring up uh, all the description of uh, the product. You know, they got the price on it. They got a barcode, and that's it. But, but let, let me let me point this out to you. Uh, <clears throat> because of your circumstances, you're heavily involved with cognitive purchasing. I mean, it's a very mental activity. Okay, a lot of what happens in the store is emotive, not cognitive. Mm -hmm. uh, in in fact. Uh, you know, you you probably exercise significantly more discipline on your shopping simply because it is a cognitive process for you. You know, and and what you said you were missing was the emotive was the emotive part, and that's true. But uh, if you uh, if you uh, uh, oh, there, there's a there's a book out right now called uh, uh, How We Decide, outstanding book. Uh, but it goes along with the, like Gladwell's Blink uh, at how. Uh, but the, the how we decide points out that the emotive decision making uh, is superior in many ways to cognitive, depending mm -hmm. on the circumstances. So uh, if, if if you read, I, I'd uh, recommend that book. Of course, I always recommend my book, you know. But I've already <laughs> read my book. See, <laughs> so. Uh, we're going to try to get your book and uh, read it, Doctor. Is it available in uh, the, the local bookstore? Uh, you can stores? get it on Amazon. Amazon? Yeah, yeah insidethemindoftheshopper.com. It's one word, insidethemindoftheshopper.com. Insidethemindoftheshopper.com. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I have a website, insidethemindoftheshopper.com. You can Great. go there, and actually that links to uh, you know some blog material that I have. And there will be a link to this, uh, <clears throat> to this uh, uh, podcast uh, there also in the not uh, distant future. So Great. Well, thank you for answering my question. You bet. And Mr. Media, Thanks. always always a pleasure. Thank you for calling. Good to talk You're to welcome. you. Sure. All right. Take care. You know, as we're talking about technology in the stores, I'm thinking I'm in Florida where uh, Publix uh, supermarkets are predominant. One and, of the best uh, retailers I, in the country, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But there is one little fault that I would have for them, you, I don't think, I guess maybe it has something to do with what service you have, but most people I know find that when they go into a Publix, they're cut off from the world, that their cell phones do not work in public stores. So I think if, if they're going to, if uh, they, they, I, I assume that there's some kind of a dampening uh, of some, some well, I don't know whether uh, – uh, look, I mean, I, and I, I have <laughs> no idea whether this is applicable to Publix, but you know a business can acquire a jammer that will kill all cell phones in their in – their, uh, and there has right. been extensive discussion on this issue as to whether uh, – I mean, uh, whether this is legitimate, uh, whether – what if people have an emergency? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of factors. I mean, I'm not into that, but I have seen, <laughs> uh, seen the discussions. So maybe, maybe that's what they do. I don't know. Well, and I want to come back to what we were talking about before. But first, I, I did want to ask you, uh, since we've been talking about Amazon and uh, uh, online retailing versus uh, bricks and mortars, I mean, it seems like uh, 10 years ago, right around the time of the, the big Internet bubble and then, the, and then popping that bubble, there was an expectation that, that online retailing was really going to uh, – uh, replace a good deal of bricks and mortar and that would be for yeah, both net grocer web van you know yeah. you remember those <laughs> yeah absolutely and um and uh, some of them have survived peapod i mean you know that's part of our hole right now i believe yeah yeah why did why didn't it become bigger than it than it than it did and is it is it what we're ta is what you were talking to a caller about i mean the, the emotive well, okay. sale the tactile no, uh, the, the, there there is that issue. There's the emotive and the tactile and, and the, the physical experience, uh, but there is uh, th there is another uh, very 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 important point here that uh, most people are not aware. And I know if you saw the book, you you, you know this that uh, uh, more often than any other time, people buy a single item when they go into even a supermarket or a Walmart supercenter. One is the most commonly purchased number of items in any store in the world okay and as a matter of fact in supermarkets uh, 
half of all shopping trips result in the purchase of five or fewer items. Mm -hmm. Now, the point of this is uh, these are quick trips, okay? These are, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. That, but I, just to point out to you that, uh, and Mike Twitty uh, of Unilever has a chapter in my book also on the quick trip, as well as the chapter that I that I did there. But one of the characteristics of the quick trip, I mean, the major defining point of the quick trip is either of two things. Uh, it, it's all immediacy, but uh, it's either immediate consumption or immediate need. I mean, like, for example, uh, you wanted to use this device that requires batteries, and lo and behold, the batteries are dead, and you go to the mm -hmm. drawer, and there's none there. What are you going to do? Well, you run around the corner and you know, get, some, get some batteries, or I mean, whatever. And, uh, and this is the thing, is that uh, the quick trip does not represent, and this is Mike Twitty's uh, work, uh, which was extremely valuable from my point of view. The quick trip does not result in the purchase of a spe specific selection of merchandise. Because as a matter of fact, your immediate need could be very widespread. Now, for immediate co consumption, I mean that kind of limit, you know, that kind of uh, prunes it down. But if you understand, the quick trip is all about immediacy, and immediacy is not going to be served by the internet unless it's a, you know, a, a, a you know, a book or uh, you know something you could download, a Kindle or you know, I mean, uh, where where you could download uh, or music you can download. Okay. <clears throat> But the immediacy means that, uh, you know, the offline retailer is not going away uh, until, you know, we get beam me up, Scotty, you know. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, you know, IBM has done some serious work on uh, teleporting. I don't know whether you're aware of that. You can find it on their website. But uh, the, the, the reality is uh, we're not there. I mean, this is uh, way out there. Uh, and uh, and the emotional thing and all of these other factors. I mean, a hundred years from now, who knows what shopping will be? But uh, you know, for, for most of our lifetimes, I mean, there's going to be stores. You know, offline stores. Right. So um, the quick trip uh, really hit me, uh, especially because I, I did one of those yesterday. Uh, and it's interesting. Those are more profitable, right, for the stores? Oh, yes. Well, they can be. They can be. Unfortunately, and this is one of the major pieces of advice <clears throat> that I have for uh, retailers and uh, <clears throat> is simply this. I mean, first of all, there is way too much obsession by everybody in the shopper world about money. <clears throat> And the reason is because it's easy. You can count it. I mean, you take it to the bank. and I mean, this is a very important factor. I'm not trying to downplay that. <clears throat> but when it comes to a shopper buying, money is a far less important factor, and particularly for quick trips. Uh, quick trippers close on the sale very rapidly. Uh, I mean, they spend money at a hellacious rate. When you run into the store and you want one, two, three, four items, whatever, you aren't standing here studying and weighing and whatever. Again, I point out a lot of shopping is not cognitive in nature. It is not thought through or whatever. It's instinctive. People always argue about how many decisions, purchase decisions are made in the store. And the reality is large numbers of them, uh, large numbers of them aren't made at all in, in the classic decision sense. Or if there is a decision, it was made five years ago when you got in the habit of buying this. And you now buy it instinctively. It isn't. It isn't a decision process. That's all wrong to think of it that way. So, uh, you know. So, so, so the point is, is that the quick tripper is is in for speed and uh, are more than willing, you know, to to uh, to spend a little extra. I mean, I mean, they aren't even going to know they spent a little extra. It, it is. An, their time is far more valuable now. Unfortunately for the shopper, uh, you know. Or maybe, you know, I mean, you don't have a time awareness. I mean, you don't sit and shop with a stopwatch, and, you know, you're not aware of that. Now, I, I measure it, so I know how people are responding to time. And I can tell you, uh, the faster stores close sales, the more, the more that store will sell, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's, uh, uh, that's one of the most fundamental learnings that's come out of our many years of study here. And that is that uh, for the shopper, in many ways, it's all about the speed. In fact, you know, even end caps where they usually have promotions or whatever. Glenn, Tur right. uh, Glenn Turbeck did a study on this and, and showed that 50% uh, <clears throat> of the people who bought an item on promotion in the store were unaware that it was a promotional price. 
and of the half who were aware, 50% of them didn't care. Mm. Which means, I mean, and, and, and this is very, I, I, we don't have time to go into this in great detail, but I just will tell you that money is a lot less important at retail for the shopper and for the retailer, you know, than, 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 uh, and the brand than, than people think. And uh, so the, the, the point is, uh, uh, when I get on shows with consumer, you know, consumer organizations of one type or another, whatever, you know, they're always in this mode that, well, you know, how can people save money? Well, like they wanted to. Uh, yes, there is a small vociferous group uh, that that uh, you know is out to save money, and uh, I would never recommend a store abuse their shoppers by, you know, by o- overcharging for things. But on the other hand, uh, you go down the street and buy milk at a convenience store, and you're paying fifty cents or a dollar more than you would at the supermarket, typically, right. or or whatever. And, and you know, you, nobody feels bad. At, why are you doing that? It's convenient. It's all about time, you know, and, and how handy it is. So. Uh, this isn't a matter of uh, – uh, it, it's a matter of, of the retailer and the brand aligning with the shopper and delivering good value. Good value may mean, hey, you can get in this store and out, okay, in 15 minutes where it takes you 20 in another store. Mm-hmm. Now, what's that well, worth? And mm-hmm. I tell you, it's worth a heck of a lot to most people. And, well, and it sure. isn't just the speed. You know, it's the, the angst, the – uh, misery of making decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Herb, two of the points that you make, I think these are connected. You stop me if I'm wrong here. Uh, one is on, on with regard to the short trip that uh, retailers could can make a lot more money and increase sales if they focus on the short trips, just trying to get people to buy one, to, one, two, or three more of the vital items that they need. But the other thing you say, and I think this is connected, is that uh, retailers like uh, Stu Leonard and uh, Aldi and a couple of the others, that they have found it very profitable to carry fewer items. Yes, instead yes. of giving, giving you the, the, uh, the alphabet of everything that's available in a category, they focus on a handful. You know, they, may, they may carry 1,000 a, a items rather than 5,000 items, and their, their volume is higher, and they sell more, and uh, they probably do better on the short trips too. Yeah. Well, here, yes. As a matter of fact, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Stu Leonard, as I as I mentioned, does something like a hundred million a year in their stores. Uh, typical supermarket's going to do more like twenty million. So, yeah. how come they can sell five times as much? Is it because they've succeeded in holding the shopper in the store a long time? No. As a matter of fact, it takes people less time to shop at a Stu Leonard's than it than it does at a Wegman's. Okay. I mean, the the point is is simply this is. Uh, Stu Leonard uh, has has uh, okay. Well, let, let, uh, but but let, let's get back to the uh, the issue of of a skew rationalization or limiting the choice, uh, whatever. Okay, because there's more than one way to skin that cat. Okay, <laughs> N- number one, uh, yes, there is a huge cost. Okay, it, to the shopper to have to make a choice between a hundred items instead of making a choice between three. Okay. But there's more than one way to deal with that. Look, I, I, I buy a few books a month at Amazon, but one of the reasons I do business with them is because they, they have, if anybody has 50 million books, they probably have the one I want. Now, believe me, people go to stores in the same way. You walk into a store that's got 40 or 50,000 SKUs. One of the reasons you do is because you're comfortable. Man, they've got everything here. Okay? The problem isn't having everything there. In fact... Having everything there is a very, very attractive feature. So Stu Leonard may have started with 800 SKUs, but he's up to 2,000. Why? Mm-hmm. Because he needs to attract more people to the store. You know, Aldi, Aldi and, uh, and Little, Little are doing the same thing. Uh, hey, Fresh and Easy is upping their SKU count. I mean, Walmart came in against their 3,500 with 10,000. Okay, but here's the problem they have. As they start building skew count, they take the big head, the items that most people want to buy, and bury them in there. It'd be like uh, it'd be like Amazon ignoring what's the number one seller in this category, okay, and hiding it and saying, well, you know, we're not going to tell you. You 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 just pick what you want. Don't, no, we're not going to tell you. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, uh, for example, you know, I mentioned. Uh, 
uh, How We Decide as a book. I recommended it. Actually, that's the number one book on Amazon that sells with my book. <laughs> mm, interesting. You know? Uh, that's not why I got it. I, somebody recommended it to me some time ago is the reason I got it. But but it's it's kind of interesting. Okay, but the point I'm getting at is uh, the number one reason the retailer uh, loses from this massive skew count is then they refuse to have the guts to tell the shopper what to buy. Okay, and it's very simple, really. All you've got to do is uh, put, uh, you know, put, I mean, like end caps, for example, which, which sell a huge amount of what sells in the store anyway. One of the, there's two, reason, two major reasons end caps sell so well. Number one, limited selection, okay? Uh, but that doesn't detract from, I mean, you've got 10 items here on the end cap, you know, and you've got uh, 1,500 on the aisle right next to it. Mm -hmm. Well, which is easier to make a decision? From these 10 or from these 1,500. And the second thing is it's visually distinct. And mm -hmm. this is one of the problems in the aisle is the shopper comes in and you've got an unbroken sea, okay, of offers. And an unbroken sea of offers is equivalent to no offers at all. I mean, you're just saying, oh, there's a lot of stuff, huh, a lot of stuff, okay. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, you can do, I mean, and we've, we've recommended this, I recommend this to any retailer right now. Find out what the top 20 or 50 items are in your store that you sell. This is the customer's vote, okay? The customers are choosing. These are the top 20 items they want to buy. And uh, we had one store that went around and put a little four by four foot flag on the shelf by each of these top items and said, uh, 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 this is our top seller in the category. And th they had maybe 50 of these in an entire supermarket, okay? That's not very many, okay? That's one or two or three an aisle. Okay, so h here's the point. Uh, they got a 52% lift on those items, hmm. okay? I mean, we're talking serious stuff. And, and quite frankly, you know, the promotion they used there was pathetically thin. But I will tell you, if they had put in... Five times as many of those tags that it would had no effect. Okay, because a blizzard of offers is the same thing as no offer at all. Right. And uh, so anyway. it's, it's blinding. It's, it's blinding. It's, it's blinding. Yeah. You're saying, oh, you got you, you, everybody's walked into an aisle and seen, you know, uh, uh, you know, a thousand pink tags or blue tags or yellow tags <laughs> or what the heck kind of, and who gives a rip, you know? Mm. I mean, this isn't communication, uh, and you know, which brings us to another thing. I mean, people mostly communicate in the store emotionally by shape and color and and uh, whatever. They don't. I mean, words, uh, you know, are are not nearly as persuasive, and uh, yet there's a lot of careful thought given to what to say here, what to right. say. Well, you know, you need to stop using words to say. Okay, and and an end cap is one way. You don't have to put a sign on an end cap that says, "Oh, hey, here, buy here, buy here." No, you've shoved it right in the in the mainstream of traffic. It's only got a few items on it, okay, and the shopper's eye is stopped, and it's stopped not because this is terrific merchandise or a terrific sale. If you look at their eye, it comes to a sharp demarcation. Okay, this is very important. Okay, now I'm looking in the aisle, and my eye moves along here, and bang. Okay, there's a sudden change, and now I'm looking at an end cap. I move a few feet on, and it breaks and goes to aisle again. Okay, those demarcations essentially are signs to the shopper that here's an offer. Okay, and so, hey, you know, and there's not that many of them in the store. And, uh, you know, so you have a heavy amount of, uh, of selling uh, going on there. And it isn't the pricing, believe me. It, it, I mean, I'm going to tell you something. You know, you, you have the consumer activists that scream bloody murder if the retailer puts uh, puts merchandise on an end cap and it's not on special. <laughs> okay? Yeah, because we're trained to think it is special. <laughs> okay, but let, let me tell you something. Uh, this is the same thing as going from high-low pricing to EDLP. But I, I, have, I have heard more than one senior executive in retailers tell me, you know, they can scream all they want to. We're still going to do it. And mm. it's a good thing because you have people who are basically what I call 
you know, they're the bottom feeder shoppers that have massive stacks of coupons and are racing around and uh, and systematic. I mean, I had a woman work for me one time that came in and told me she bought two hundred dollars worth of groceries for twenty dollars. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, that for her, that's wonderful. Yeah. But the damage that is done to the retailing world, okay, uh, suppliers and other shoppers by this is is uh, you know it's more it's more reasonable instead of having this high low pricing to go with EDLP. But you know what I'm talking about? E- everyday low pricing. Oh, you don't, okay. Yeah. The prices don't go up and down. You don't have these super. Uh, it, everything isn't. Oh, now this is on special. Okay, now it's not. Okay, now it's on special. Now it's not. That's called high low pricing. And okay. uh, and these people with coupons and racing around or whatever, they live and die on this stuff. Do you know in the Northeast, uh, uh, P and G a number of years ago at- attempted to withdraw couponing completely. And the consumers came out hammer and tongs, and after, it was a horrendous PR disaster. They ended up having to go back and install them. Coupons are economically stupid, stupid, stupid. The bottom line is they cost shoppers, the products that, that are couponed end up costing shoppers more because of the cost of managing this massive program, which is so, so inefficient. High low pricing is inefficient. All aspects of it are. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something a senior executive told me <clears throat> that back in the 90s, they their store went from high low pricing to EDLP. Okay? Mm-hmm. They went from this up and down, up and down, up and down, trying to coax the shopper in. Now, when they do that, you know, they're marking stuff down, but other stuff is way up. I mean, they're, they're, they're figure So it's kind of like a game, a contest between you and the retailer. Okay? But uh, in the 90s, <clears throat> this entire chain switched to EDLP. In other words, they didn't have promotionals anymore. Everything is a low price or the, as low as they can reasonably make it and still operate efficiently. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he told me, he says, you have no idea the volume of hate mail we got <laughs> from these consumerists, you know, that are, uh, you know, whatever. And he said, but they, they stuck with their guns. They stuck with it for an entire year, and they, they continue today. It's still an EDLP operation. And he, he told me that, uh, that uh, they hope those shoppers that were sending all of that hate mail to them are now shopping at their competitors. He, he told <laughs> me that this was the first time, uh, uh, just to give you a clue, this was the first time in 50 years this chain had made any money selling groceries. Wow. Okay. Well, now, you, you, and and if you realize that usually they don't make money selling groceries because they're getting paid by the manufacturers to put the stuff on the shelf, but and, they and actually her, made a legitimate profit first time in fifty years. And actually, this is the I, I want. We're, we're going to run out of time soon. This okay. is the thing I wanted. To, I wanted to wind up with you about. Um, you talk about uh, where the money actually is in retail, particularly right now, we've been talking really primarily about uh, the groceries, but, uh, you say it comes from four sources and of them, I think consumers will be surprised to hear this. Consumer spending is actually the lowest contributing factor. Can you go through high to low where, where the stores actually well, yeah, make Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in the tipping and, you know, business models vary around the world, you know, and whatever. But in the, uh, the the American CPG industry, okay, which is the fast-moving consumer goods, the stuff that people buy every day, the branded items and all of that, okay, the number one uh, source of profits for retailers is is from the brand supplier, the manufacturer, in slotting fees, uh, rebates, promotional allowances, and other type of money. In fact, I can tell you, uh, retailing is globally a thirteen trillion dollar business. Mm-hmm. In the U.S. market alone, uh, brand suppliers pay one trillion dollars a year to the retailers. Okay, so that's their number one source of profits. Okay, number two is is cash, uh, f- uh, interest on cash. That's float. In other words, they get the money, they collect the money from. As one uh, retail executive told me years ago, uh, the one good thing about retail is people leave their money cash on the counter, <laughs> you know, hmm. and they hustle that money to the bank and immediately begin co- collecting on it and pay their suppliers as slowly as they can. There's a lot right. of money from that. So uh, number one, they're very good at negotiating with suppliers. Number two, they're very good at managing cash. Uh, their banking business is huge. 
Number three is real estate because they buy and develop property, which appreciates over the years and becomes worth a lot of money. That's their third source of profit. And their fourth source is uh, margin on merchandise sold. And the high margin items are, quite frankly, going to mostly be uh, the perimeter departments, the fresh meat, the deli, the, the bakery, the produce. Uh, these, are, uh, these are departments that the retailer runs themselves. Uh, these are not participated in by the brand manufacturers for the most part. Okay, so uh, uh, you know that, that's uh, you, you can look, that's where their expertise lies is in that order one two three four. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, this our time went by very very quickly, um, and I, I want to tell people how to find your book and your website, uh, folks. You can uh, you can find Herb Sorensen's new book Inside the Mind of the Shopper, the Science of Retailing at uh, mrmedia.com, it's mrmedia.com, or amazon.com. And you can also learn more about what he does and the way he does it at insidethemindoftheshopper.com. That's all solid, insidethemindoftheshopper.com. Or his uh, company is TNS uh, Sorensen, and their website, which may be very similar, tns-sorensen, S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N.com. And uh, Herbert was fascinating. Uh, I had... I had way more things to talk to you about, but we covered an awful lot. Uh, the book is very interesting, quite an eye-opener, I think, particularly for consumers, and uh, uh, I wish you a lot of luck with it. I appreciate that very much, any time. All right. Thank you very much for coming on Mr. Media today. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And, folks, for uh, dozens more uh, interviews with business executives and entrepreneurs, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversation with Isidore Sharp, the founder of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, and many, many others. Please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. Whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Pointer Online, MySpace, Facebook, NetVibes, Amazon, uh, Multiply, Zanga, Digital Journal, Friendster, Orkut, Bebo, Tagged, I Google, Yahoo, <laughs> Yahoo, I love the way that sounds, a Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, or Odeo. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. And subscribe to Mr. Media in iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews within the podcast section of iTunes and click the free subscribe button. It's that easy. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. That's A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.twitter.com slash andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day and spend it with us. 